Okay, so let's talk now about manipulating data. So what do I mean by that? Oops. There we go. <laughs> All right. So what we're doing in the first part of this lecture in lab is reshaping data. Um, so does kind of what it sounds like. We are actually just not really changing the data contents, but changing how they look and how the data are in different columns and different rows. Um, so first we'll go over how to reshape data from wide format, sometimes called fat data, um, to long, sometimes, sometimes called tall data. Um, we'll learn how to do the exact opposite. So the undoing of that is reshaping data from long to wide. And then after our first lab, we'll go into a little bit about merging data and joining data. And so this is really helpful if you have multiple tables, you know, you have patients, ages and demographic data in one table, and then you have like their clinical data in another table, but you want to combine them. Um, that can be really useful. Um, and a little bit of performing operations by grouping. Okay, so what is wide versus long data? Like I said, data is just stored differently. The data itself doesn't actually differ, um, but it's stored differently inside of a tibble or a data frame. Generally speaking, wide data has many columns. So if we look down here, this is actually um, COVID vaccination rate by month. And so if we look at Alabama, um, June was a little higher than May, was a little higher than April. Um, but we've got a different column for each month and we could easily see how that could uh, turn into lots of columns. Long data, on the other hand, the column names themselves actually become part of the data itself. And so let's say I take this and I'm like, okay, I want it to be long format. Um, we see multiple entries for Alabama over here. Um, and now those column names that I had up here actually appear in the name column. Um, those values of you know, vaccination rate are appearing in the value column. Okay, so all the data is the same, but really I'm just kind of putting things in um, a different arrangement. The slightly more complicated example, you know, what if we have more than one row of data? That's very common. Um, so again, this is the wide format. We see kind of the numbers, they populate many columns. Um, but they all are kind of, you know, meaning the same thing, just the differences in times are indicated by the different columns. But if we were to put that in long format, we'll have, again, multiple entries for states. So Alabama um, appears multiple times, Alaska appears multiple times, and then those column names become actual data. So they become a, a character in this case, um, indicating what was once the column name. Okay, so we can see that the vaccination rates are all now kind of con conveniently in this value column. So they all are, you know, kind of stored in one place versus this wide format, they were distributed across multiple columns. Okay. And it just you know, to drive this point home, data is wide or long with respect to certain variables. In this case, patient only appears, um, patient ID might only appear once, but when we convert it to long format, it appears multiple times, um, but we only have two columns now for day and for value versus here in the wide version where we had multiple columns and the data just filled in um, kind of everywhere. Okay, so why, why does this matter? Um, wide, I think, you know, it's easier for humans to read. Like, I don't want to read, personally, if I was looking at an Excel file or something, I wouldn't want to read 
Alabama a hundred times. I think that gets a little unwieldy. Um, but R doesn't think the same way. So having data in long format is actually easier for R to make plots, to do analysis. Um, it just is keeps, um, keeps it organized in a way that, that R can make sense of. So let's say um, I wanted to maybe do some kind of t-test or I wanted to do some plotting of the vaccination rates I could easily tell R to look at this column versus telling it to look at all of these columns um, might get a little bit tricky. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. Um, we'll pull in this data set. I think we've used it before. Um, this um, uh, bus data from Baltimore. Um, so we'll go ahead and read it in like we've been reading a lot of our data in with the read CSV function. Carrie talked about this paste zero function in the last lecture. It really just combines these strings. And I just did that for a practical reason is I didn't want this URL hanging off the page. So you don't really need that in your code. But in this case, um, I've combined them in, uh, in the paste zero function. Um, and so this is what our data looks like. It's uh, a tibble, it's um, got a lot of these pretty like repetitive columns. So there's orange line, orange line, orange line repeated kind of several times. And then we see that more, there's a purple line, um, there's the green line, basically a bunch of different columns. And each one is gonna represent a different kind of, um, I think what they're doing here is they're tracking ridership. So how many boardings, how many departures um, and what's the average of those. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of different columns with a lot of different information in them and that can get a little unwieldy for R to work with. Okay, so let's get into the functions that help us do that. The tidier package, which is part of the tidyverse, um, can allow you to do what's called pivoting your data. So pivot longer can make multiple columns into variables, basically going from wide to long. Pivot wider does the opposite. So taking us from long data to wide. And then I think we covered this a little bit, um, but there's some functions that are going to be really useful for us when we have you know, I, I mentioned before we have the, the bus line color and the you know type of statistic, um, those are scrunched together. And so it really might be nice to separate those into two different columns. Okay. And just a note, there is a command called the reshape or the um, a function called reshape. Um, even the documentation for this function says it's confusing. So if the writers are willing to admit that it's confusing, I, I personally don't use it, um, but uh, I would recommend um, using something else. So I would recommend using pivot longer and pivot wider. You may also see the former versions of these functions. They're, they're pretty new. They used to be called um, pivot longer was gather and pivot wider was spread. And they're a little, they use them, uh, you can use them a little bit differently, but they do very similar things. Okay, so how do we do this in practice? Pivot longer puts column data into rows. Okay, but first we wanna describe which columns we actually want to pivot longer. Um, then we'll use the names to argument to give a new name to the pivoted columns. And then we'll use the values to argument to give basically a new name to those numbers and that data that was stored in those columns. Okay, if we're doing it in the tidy way, we'll take first the data set, use the pipe, and then the pivot longer function. The columns we're going to be pivoting are these right here. And so instead of just writing them out, because these are, you know, I, I am for sure that I would make a typo typing these out, 
Um, I'm just going to use a helper select function. So this starts with um, and then go ahead and list out the different lines. Um, so that way I can just kind of pull them all together. And I'll separate that by a comma and then add the names to argument. I want to pivot it, it into a column. Basically, those column names, I want them to be part of this var, uh, var column. And the values, I want them in a number column. Okay, and we can see a little bit of a preview of what that looks like. Um, just remember, this is kind of what our data looked like before. It was very wide and a little bit, you know, hard to read. Um, and now those column names are part of the var, co uh, var column and the data is in the number column. Another way we could do this, um, we have a ton of different columns here. So instead of doing the starts with or listing them all out by hand, we could use the exclamation point, which um, I was saying earlier is kind of like the opposite day function does, you know, it's just saying, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do the exact opposite. Um, we can select which columns we don't want to pivot. So that's very useful if you have like only a couple columns that have something like a, an ID in them, and then tons and tons of descriptive data to the right. Um, so in this case, it's the same exact function, but instead of the starts with, I'm just saying exclamation point, um, and then concatenating those columns that I want to keep, um, or sorry, the columns that I don't want to pivot. Okay. And so this data looks the same as this. Okay. And uh, it should make sense that after we're going from wide to long, we're not getting rid of any data. Okay. And so each, hypothetically, each of those columns had the same amount of information in them. And so when we take them into a single column and we were to break them down by group, they should have the same amount of information. So I see here that um, the data that I have for each of these categories in VAR is the same. Um, and one thing to note is our data set is now much longer because we've kind of repeated, um, repeated the data. Um, by, by pushing those former columns into a single column. Okay, we already talked about this a little bit, but I think it's kind of important for this uh, data set um, that we are able to separate these out. I think they're uh, you know, not so meaningful on their own um, and we might want multiple columns. And so we can use mutate here. And on the left hand side, I want, um, I indicate which column I, you know, if I wanted a new column, I could put it here. But in this case, we're, we're overriding var. And then what are we overriding it with? So we're going to do a string replace on the var column. We'll do replace board with underscore board, okay? So it's replacing this string that it finds and it's basically adding that underscore. So each time I'm seeing a light, I'm replacing it with underscore a light and so on. So average, replacing it with underscore average. Um, so the nice thing is when I'm using this mutate function, I can add multiple columns that I wanna mutate. So here I've replaced var with like a slightly improved version of var. Same thing here and same thing here, replacing it with a slightly improved version. And you can see that it's inserted this underscore um, as with this pattern. Okay, and again, like we worked on before, we can use the separate function to go ahead and split var into line and type columns. And as Carrie mentioned, we need to indicate what the separate is. And in this case, we're gonna use the uh, underscore. If we had wanted to use like a different symbol over here, when we did the string replace, we, we could have also done that and 
indicated that symbol right here. Okay, so nice and convenient. We have two columns now. And if we were to want to undo that, we can use the unite function. Um, so taking the data set using unite and then just telling it which columns we want to unite. And what we're separating it by. Okay. Okay, if we want to do the opposite, I remember I mentioned that you can go from wide to long, but maybe you also want to go from long to wide. Uh, we can do that with the pivot wider function. So as I said, it spreads rows into columns. So now, right now we have a really long data set, but let's say we want to separate um, out these groups that we made before. So we made this category type that has boardings, alightings, and average. Okay, maybe we want to spread that out wide. Okay, so the way we do that is taking that data set once again, piping it into the pivot wider function. And this one is a little easier. It takes a, a little bit less, um, fewer arguments to go ahead and pivot wider. So all we want to do is indicate which column is actually be going to become our column names. And so here we're indicating names from, I want to get those new column names from the type column. And I want to get the values that are going to fill out those multiple columns. I want to get those from the number column. Okay, so remember type and number. Type and number are going to become that new, uh, that new, those new columns with the new data. Okay. And you can see here, it has basically widened the data set to include these three new columns instead of having a column for type. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump to the first part of the lab. Okay, so where we had left off was talking about different types of uh, pivoting longer and wider, working with long and wide data and did a little lab on that. Uh, but now we're gonna talk about joining data. So this is if, uh, as a reminder, if you have multiple tables, so maybe you have some data that has demographic information and maybe some data about visits or collecting samples or something like that. So um, merging data sets together usually occurs on some kind of key variable. So sometimes R can look for this or you specify it. Um, but in this case, let's you know, think about merging by ID, you know, patient ID or sample ID or something like that. As always, you can use the question mark join to investigate some information about different joins. Um, this particular um, you know, query in your console will pull up the different types of uh, joins that fall in the dplyr package. And so some of those, uh, the ones we're going to cover today are inner join, which takes two arguments, and it only finds rows that are a match for both X and Y. Full join does the same exact thing. So same two arguments and it finds all rows of X and Y. So keeps everything. Left join is, is what it sounds like. So all rows of the first thing, the thing on the left, in this case, X, all rows of X are kept even if they're uh, not merged with Y and right join. So very similar to left join, it just keeps everything on the right hand side. And so you may already be thinking, well, okay, these are kind of redundant. I could just switch the place of, of X and Y, but it does change a few things, it changes the order of the data and the order of your columns. So, so you're right, they are very similar, uh, but maybe you want your data arranged in a slightly different way. Okay, and we're not going to talk about anti-join, but it actually uh, 
is kind of good for, you know, maybe excluding some data where you don't have, um, or excluding data from like a, a table that maybe has IDs you want to get rid of. So all rows from X that are not found in Y um, and keeping just the columns from X. Okay, so basically um, we're not looking for the overlap here, but rather finding what doesn't overlap, but only for X. Okay, so let's take a look at two different tibbles to kind of practice this. So this base tibble that we're gonna talk about in a second, it has baseline data for IDs one through 10, and it also has an age column. So we can, this is just creating it here. And then if we wanna look at the head of this base tibble, you know, we can see that it's got this ID column and this age column. Starts with one, goes all the way to 10, and there's some ages in here. Visits on the other hand, so this is the other one, has IDs two through 11. So it's a little bit different from the first table. And it has three visits, uh, you know, basically a visit ID and some kind of outcome. I'm not sure what this is measuring, just uh, you know, made up numbers for now, okay? So this is actually making that table. And here we're looking at the head of it. We see that we have columns ID just like in our base table and visit and outcome. So I really think it's important to kind of get a good sense of data before you merge it. So I actually wanna look at these with you really quick. So this is our base table, as I said, one through 10, and then some age information. And then we go down to visits. We have IDs two, and then this repeated ID two once again, all the way through 11. And we have a, a little bit longer of a table here. So the, the sizes between these two are, are a bit different. Okay, um, so base table has 10 rows, visits table has 30 rows. So what happens when we do an inner join? So again, inner join is the function and the two arguments are gonna be your two tibbles in this case. Um, R automatically knows that you wanna join by ID. This is the column that actually overlaps between the two tables. Important to note that they are spelled the same. Um, and so when we join it doing the inner join, remember that we're only keeping what is common. So we're only keeping the common IDs between the two tables. So when we look at the dimensions, we can see we have fewer rows than uh, the visits table. So we're only keeping those, those rows or those IDs found in both tables. And if we preview the data a little bit, remember that base had ID one, but in this case, it's been excluded because there's not an ID one in visits. Okay, so left join is gonna be a little bit different. So again, left join is the function and our two arguments are the tables. And in this case, we're keeping everything from base, but only the matches from visits. We can look at our dimensions. They're a little bit longer, so, or sorry, the, just the row, um, the rows, the columns should be the same. <laughs> um, so we have one extra data point than we, or one extra row than we had before. And if we take a look just at the top of this new data frame that has been joined, um, we can see that we have this ID um, one is now included. But because there was no match in visits, it's populated those with NAs. Okay, so one really handy package that might clear up some of what's actually going on during joins is this package tidy log. So you'll probably need to install this by running this particular code right here. You only need to run it once. Uh, for each version of R, 
But once you go ahead and log, um, load it up in your workspace, and then you perform a join afterward, it gives you all of this really useful information. So it says, okay, well, there was a row that was only an X. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that. There was one row. There were some rows that were only in Y, and there were three of these. But you told me this is a left join, so I'm actually not going to keep those from the uh, the right hand um, tibble in this case. So the parentheses here indicate that those rows have been dropped. And finally, it tells us how many matches there are. I'll uh, talk about what this means in a second. But then it tells us, OK, well, here's the total number of rows given everything up above. OK, so this can provide us a little bit of insight what's going on with some of the other joins. So if we were to do a right join on you know, x equals base and y equals visits, uh, because we're keeping everything on the right hand side, but only keeping the matches on the left hand side, we actually drop that one row from base and keep those three rows from visits. Again, uh, keeping all the matches in a right join and it tells us, oh, okay, well, there's 30 rows now. Okay, and so, um, interesting thing, if we were to, like I said before, swap the position of the two, um, the two inputs that we had, so base is left, visits is right, and now let's just swap them and do a left join, uh, we can see that the numbers are really the same, it's just the position that has switched in this uh, tidy log below. Okay, and once again, full join, uh, this gives us, um, you know, it's telling us what's going on. Basically, we're keeping all of the mismatched um, rows, keeping all of the matched rows, and this will give us 31 rows in our data. So it's actually building a longer data set than either of the two individually. Okay, and so um, what I said before about um, includes duplicates, what does this mean? This just means that you are duplicating some of your data from one of your tables. So in this case, data from base is being duplicated. So if we look down here at this full join, um, we can see that we have multiple lines that are ID2 and age. So these are all the same. So that just means that we're repeating the same line of data from base multiple times. And so sometimes that's not what you want, um, but in this case, uh, this is okay. If we want to dive a little bit more into data that could be duplicated, um, we can use the duplicated function. So that could give us an indication if there are duplications in a vector. So that could be a column. Um, so this case, we have one through five. It's telling us, yeah, we, we had numbers one through five. There was no repeated number in there. But if we tell it one, two, three, four, five, one, the first five are okay, but then it says, okay, well, I saw one before. So I'm going to say, okay, that is true. That is truly duplicated there. And so it only tells us the, the second occurrence and, and further of a value that we've seen before. And so we can do this in a tidy way. We can take our full join data set and we can create using mutate a new column, dupe ID, which is duplicated uh, values of ID. And so we don't see any duplicated data for ID one. The first ID two is okay, but then once we get to the second ID two, it's okay. Yes, we see that ID has been duplicated here. So this can be useful for making new columns to indicate what's going on in other columns. <clears throat> 
Sometimes we might want to join on something more than ID, maybe multiple criteria. Um, but in that case, we just use a third argument in our joins by equals and then whatever we want to join on. So in this case, we're joining on ID, but if we wanted to provide a vector of ID and maybe um, some other criteria, um, like the particular hospital a patient was at or something like that, um, we could do that as well. All right, so let's do a couple lab exercises and then we'll be on our way. <laughs> 